Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to this PCST webinar on the topic of scientific culture. Uh, you're very welcome wherever you're joining us from. Uh, as you have seen, this is one of a series of webinars held by PCST, the Public Communication of Science and Technology Network. This started in May of 2020, uh, when we were unable to hold our uh, planned physical conference for all the reasons that you know. Uh, but the webinars are going to continue even in the change circumstances uh, into next year, uh, at least. Um, this webinar in particular is associated with an effort which started in Mexico and which has now got support in other countries to have an international day of scientific culture. Uh, that's not yet a formally recognized international day, but it is part of, it's a subject of a campaign. And I know that there are events taking place apart from this one. There are events taking place in Mexico, of course, in Peru, that I have seen also in India tomorrow on the 28th, which is the day, 28th of September is the day chosen to be the international day. So as an international organization, and given that the campaign itself is inherently international, uh, I suppose it's important that we pay attention to the international differences of context that affect how we understand or use and apply and interpret and so on, uh, of phrases that we share that often we think mean the same thing in different contexts, but actually can turn out to mean rather different things. So that's what the purpose of today's conversation is. Uh, and you've seen the names up on the screen of our uh, participants, our panelists, uh, but I'll go through them again. Susana Herrera Lima from Mexico. She's a professor of science communication at ITESO University. Aksu Kim from South Korea is professor of transdisciplinary studies at the Digist Institute in Daegu, Korea, and emeritus professor of communication at Sogan University. And Haksu is a former member of the scientific committee of the PCST network. Leah Tarragon Zeller is an assistant professor of public policy and cultural studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel. And Massimiano Buki is Professor of Science and Technology and Society at the University of Trento in Italy. Also, uh, he is a current member of the Scientific Committee of PCST Network, as I am myself, Brian Trench. Uh, I'm immediate past uh, president of PCST. Uh, you all now have, uh, we now have 69 people attending. Uh, and you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen that there's a Q&A function and a chat function. And some people are saying good morning to us uh, in chat, which is fine for chat. For questions that are sp specific uh, and substantively related to the topic, please put those into Q&A. If you want to either ask a panelist a question or make a general comment on something that's come up, use Q&A to do that. But we're very happy to have the good mornings and good afternoons uh, coming in on chat from South Africa, from India uh, and elsewhere. That's great. So my opening question to the panel is a very apparently simple one, but I think as time goes on, it may turn out that it's not quite so simple. However, let me try. Uh, Massimiano, uh, first, what does scientific culture mean to you? For me, as I will as I will try to to explain later, um, it, it will be better to use other expressions like science in culture or the culture of science in society. Uh, of course, scientific culture has a history, and we should be aware of that. But uh, as I said, I, I find we could use other expressions that are more useful to understand the contemporary dynamics of uh, of science in society and science in culture. Okay, that's a that's a very good start, which is actually not to use the phrase, but uh, we'll come back to hear more detail why. Leah, what's your reaction to it? Uh, what 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 does it mean to you when you hear the phrase? So thank you for getting us started here. Um, so I think that both science and culture are very packed terms, as all of us know, and this is not the place to start to take that apart. But as an ethnographer, 
I think what I most under what I find most interesting in my work and what I do is trying to understand what science means to the people that I'm speaking to, which, as you know, means a lot of different things. Um, and I like to use the term and the understanding of the people that I'm speaking to instead of kind of more general phrases. And I'm really excited to share more about what that means to the people that I study during this webinar. Okay, Haksu, are you willing to say what scientific culture actually means to you? <laughs> yes, the, first of all, the culture, the term culture is a really less scientific <laughs> because it is too broad, like the term God, you see? That's why we need to be quite careful about using the culture, the term culture, I think. As in my sense, always I have used scientific culture as the public impression of science's problem solving capability. Okay, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, notion, the, the impressions that the public have. Uh, but, but before we go further into that, in, in, including into the cautions that we hear from Leah and from Massimiano, and indeed I have shared them. Uh, Susanna, could you give us the background to this? How did this campaign start uh, in Mexico, in the organization that you're a member of, So Medicite? Uh, and what's the, what's the aim and what's the motivation? Okay, thank you, Brian. Yes, the campaign to declare, declare the International Day for Scientific Culture is an initiative of So Medicite, as, as you have said, the Mexican Society of the Popularization of Science and Technique in Mexico. It was proposed in 2019, originally by Lourdes Patiño, former president of Somedicit. She and some Somedicit members began to work on the organization of the campaign. And the first international day was commemorated in September of 2020 during the pandemics. Well, we are still in the pandemics. <laughs> its main objective, is to position the discussion about the relevance of scientific culture in the contemporary world in the public space. I mean, it's not a celebration like a party, <laughs> as if scientific culture was installed everywhere. On the contrary, we think that this is an urgent discussion, that it is important to place these reflections and analysis around the world to share opinions, concepts, perceptions from scholars and practitioners, from decision makers, teachers, etc. Uh, the motivation comes also from some evidences before pandemics about the disinterest in science and the perceptions of it as something far from day-to-day -day life. Uh, this came from the results of some works of research in scientific culture developed in Mexico and some other countries. And this is the second time it's commemorated. And at the moment, there are 41 countries involved with 225 activities and 165 institutions and organizations around the world who have signed the letter of endorsement and counting. Uh, Somebody seat presented this initiative for an international day uh, in the regional office of uh, for Science and Technology for Latin America and the Caribbean at UNESCO. Uh, we expect uh, to get UNESCO support as more and more institutions are joining this initiative. And well, that's what I can say about the campaign. Okay, thank you very much. And it's, so it's, it's actually on a bigger scale than uh, actually I personally had appreciated uh, already, but I'm still not entirely sure we have uh, really understood what the campaign means by scientific culture. But let's, we live in a chance to come back to that, including you will have Susanna, and maybe people who are associated with the campaign can chip in on uh, the Q&A. Uh, I mean, we know that different things that sound the same can mean different things in different linguistic contexts, as I said earlier. Uh, and when I you reported to a committee of PCST uh, that this initiative was happening and that they were asking for our support and so on. Uh, certainly English speakers in the group were cautious. They didn't find it an easy concept to get hold of. Uh, partly for the reasons I think that Haksu was touching on, you know, it's very broad. 
And I remember, uh, and excuse me for the anecdote of an old man, but still allow me. Uh, at my first PCST conference in Montreal in Canada, not surprising, there was a lot of discussion about scientific culture uh, in the French usage, culture scientifique. And I remember a very significant figure in the development of science communication, an English person from the podium said, I don't really understand what you mean by scientific culture. What is this thing? We don't really understand it in English. And a very significant figure in the development of science communication, a French person stood up in the audience and said, but have you read C.P. Snow? C.P. Snow wrote a book, or well, he gave a series of lectures, which became a book on the two cultures of which one is the scientific culture. So it's actually the phrase, insofar as it has a history, it, it, one of its origins is, is in an English person's discussion of the relationship between the humanities, literature, arts, on the one hand, science and technology on the other. So uh, sometimes we even forget our own linguistic histories uh, and our own cultural histories in this sort of uh, discussion. I think I can discern about five or six different mean uses of the phrase, but I'm not going to go through them. Uh, but science and culture are connect are often connected in various ways, as as Axel already said, uh, and and uh, as Massimiano has already touched on. But uh, maybe there are two broad ways of thinking about scientific culture. Uh, one is that it might be a way of describing the status of science in a given community or city or country, or even in an individual's worldview. And that relates to the idea that Haksu just touched on there, the impressions the public has of science. Okay, so it's a, it could be used as a descriptive phrase, or it could be used as a phrase to describe something that people could aspire to or should aspire to, uh, as a set of ideas, information, and values based on science that people can acquire or appropriate, as they say in Latin America. And interestingly, uh, Susanna, just speaking about it now, referred to an international day for scientific culture, and elsewhere it's referred to as an international day of scientific culture. And those two meanings that I've just touched on may be expressed in the little word of or for. So going back to Leah, because culture is a key word in your field of anthropology. In fact, it probably causes great arguments in, in, in the field. Uh, and you've been researching attitudes to science among different communities within Israel. Does it occur to you as an anthropologist to refer to those as scientific cultures of different communities? Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you so much. So, I mean, I think what I was starting off as saying as an ethnographer is that, you know, I'm really interested in the ways people understand the world and make decisions based on them. And for me, my particular area of expertise within Israeli communities is um, ultra-Orthodox Haredi communities. And if you would think about it, um, they're kind of the worst community most people would say to look at because most of the people in that community don't really study science only from a very young age. And they're very critical um, of science culture depend in both categories. Um, but I came across the fact that even though they're very critical of science, um, they use it in everyday life and they need to find ways and meanings to make sense of science, even though they're very critical of it. Um, and I think that's why I was trying to say earlier on um, that I'm really interested in the particular perceptions. And I think this is what Hak Haksu was saying also in the beginning, and the impressions in a particular society. Now within anthropology, as I'm sure you know, culture is a big term, a lot of fights over the years. And I think today what most people do is really just um, use the community or the individual and use their perceptions to talk about, um, to kind of work from the bottom up, um, I would say. Um, and I think that using the bottom up allows us to distinguish between, if you were saying between of and for science culture. So if we base ourselves on what people are saying, we can decide which category we're talking about. 
basically. Um, I hope that's helpful. Um, yes, thank you. Um, more... Hak, so you have, a, you have a history in this respect. You set up uh, uh, an academy of scientific culture in Korea 25 years ago. Uh, was that was the term in general use at the time, or were you introducing it into the Korean context? And how has the use evolved in Korea? Uh, as I mentioned, the when I mentioned the public impression of the science is problem solving capability. The latter part is more important. So problem science is problem solving capability. That is more important. In Korean context, science is a problem solving capability was stressed, emphasized. And so academy, the Academy for Scientific Culture was uh, aimed to promote such kind of uh, sciences problem solving capability to the public and also ask scientists to convey, to communicate with the public in that sense, rather than disseminating scientific literature or scientific facts or knowledge, you see? And so that's why I pointed out in my perspective, uh, scientific culture as a public impression of a science is a problem solving capability because you, you mentioned that you know the two cultures. You know, actually two cultures indicate just the knowledge gap between science, you see, and humanities or other areas. And then you try to integrate, fill in that knowledge gap. But do you think we have a succeeded in that? No. Impossible goal. You see, that's why I am always arguing we need a new perspective of science community and also you know, about scientific culture. Even if we have failed all the time, still we are trying to fill in knowledge gap between science and the other fields, you know, which is a related deficit model. But anyway, so my point is that uh, we, uh, we should uh, uh, think about really a uh, new perspective of uh, because the people are interested, most interested in problem, solving problem, and then how science could help, you know, public's interest in problem solving. Without okay, Hak, so just going, going back to the, your idea of of scientific culture as the public's impressions of science, or the, we might say the public's images of science and so on. As, as a researcher, how would you gather information about the public's impressions of science? How would you go about that? And so in, uh, you see, you may remember my uh, the new practice model in uh, 15 years ago, 15, more than 15 years ago, Two or seven in science of communication. And so I elaborate about the observe and measure that kind of thing. For instance, impression is basically significant idea to act. You see? And so from experience with the sciences of problem solving capability, we get some significant idea from that experience. And so most of the time in that data, in my article, I showed the data. People are mostly impressed with the scientific products, like a computer, like electric devices, you know, like the airplane, you know, transportation like this. Also, science is a consequences, you know, development, life quality, you know, health, that kind of things. So like that, as you see, we could uh, extract, we could uh, check, you know, people's uh, strong impression about, about science, uh, the problems of the capability. And, and then also we could uh, check how that idea is, uh, uh, is comprised, for instance, 
Science is a really control power. Science is also strength, giving strength to something. You know? And so I elaborated the, the, the ideas, how idea is composed, constituted in that uh, article. But anyway, and so I already, you know, the, I showed such kind of measurement, but nobody, uh, not many people are using that because we are so much concerned with the attitude measurement and opinion yeah. measurement. <laughs> Learning okay, well, okay, this I think might be a good way to, to lead over into Massimiano's, uh, re to return to Massimiano's notion that it may be more useful to speak of the cultures of science in society. Massimiano, please expand on that idea. Yes, I think uh, we should start from a little bit from the history of the term scientific culture. And as you mentioned, there are two main meanings historically. One is the, the one which is often uh, referred to C.P. Snow, the idea that uh, there is a separation between scientific culture, for example, and humanistic culture. And then uh, another meaning, which is more or less equivalent to public understanding of science. Uh, what these two meanings have in common is the idea that science and general culture are separated and that science has, has and can be injected and infused into, into general culture and society at large. I think uh, this is, is very limiting in terms of our conceptual understanding and also historically is, is not accurate because since the very beginning of modern science, science was profoundly embedded in culture. Uh, I'll give you just, just a couple of examples. I mean, Galileo was, uh, as we know, I mean, was a great physicist, but uh, his, his original training was in art and he was profoundly immersed in the, his father was a musician, Galileo was a fine uh, drawer and uh, he used this chiaroscuro to, uh, to understand his observations from the moon, his, his chiaroscuro ability. Um, another example is uh, the, the enormous success in the, in the, particularly in the second half of the 19th century, enormous cultural success of science and science uh, imagery. If you think about Jules Verne, and uh, um, I mean, science was the most fashionable thing. Uh, all sorts of books from, from cooking uh, and in every domain wanted to use the term science. And, and this imagination fed back into, into general culture and society. So I think the idea of separation is, uh, is a misleading idea. And actually, C.P. Snow is a strong case in point because he was also a writer of fiction. <laughs> and and uh, so I think his, uh, his lecture has been, has been overused in uh, emphasizing uh, uh, a meaning of science uh, uh, in culture that, as I said, more and more today is, um, is not very useful to understand the interconnections of science in culture. Of course, if we, if we stick to a very specific notion of uh, the culture of science being the, the understanding of specific scientific content, uh, that, that of course um, uh, brings us back to this, this very narrow uh, diffusionist vision. But if we broaden it up a bit and we include uh, in, in the culture of science uh, the images, the ideas, the discussion, the perceptions, as Axel was was mentioning, I think we we have a very a, a much more useful and broader concept of uh, the culture of science, which includes not only content, but for example, understanding and intelligence of science role in society. Something which we have uh, come to understand much better in this pandemic, for example. Uh, the role of uh, experts, the role of experts in relationship with to politics, society, and science communication. Uh, the role of prior, wh what are the what should be the priorities of science? And of course, uh, the idea of uh, of the 
the culture of science or the culture of science in society includes and and I will and I will stop that because that would be probably a much bigger discussion includes the political culture because uh, again that that that's a very important aspect of science and culture uh, in democratic societies uh, societies with different traditions of, uh, of of the public role for example of intellectuals these are all so to conclude i think the culture uh, the, the culture of science and the culture of science in in society is a very very important thing it's so important that it's a pity that we uh, sometimes continue to address it in a very uh, narrow diffusionist way. Thanks. Uh, I think this relates uh, quite well to your work, Susanna. Um, you, you have what you describe as a socio-cultural approach to looking at science in society and looking at scientific culture. Uh, perhaps you did elaborate on what that approach involves. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, yes, um, from this sociocultural perspective, uh, we assume the premise, as I think that all of us assume, that science is a social construction and a constituent element of culture, as Leah said, uh, but what does it mean? Um, science takes part of the system of signification of the world. That is, it takes part of the system of perceptions, valuations, conceptualizations, and motivations with which subjects give meaning to the world. But it, this happens in a situated socio-historical context. Uh, therefore, the place occupied by science in these systems of significations of the world in the subjects implies a certain type of scientific culture of, of, or a cer certain type of uh, culture of science. I'm not discussing the, the term. <laughs> Uh, the, the configuration of this scientific culture will depend, likewise, as Massimiano said, from structural factors like the socioeconomic dynamics, the political context, and the institutional context. I mean, uh, we uh, take both the subjective part of this uh, cultural uh, um, configuration of, of this of science in the imaginary of the subjects and the structural factors, as, as I have said. Uh, as we all know, we can talk about one scientific culture, not only because there are many kinds of social groups, but because there are many cultures around the world and many uh, economic, and, economic and political systems. But I, 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 said that, I say that it would be desirable that science took a predominant role and place in this subject system of signification, and that it could be the articulating element in the construction of thought and meaning of the, about the world. In other words, the objective could be is to make it possible to think with science, to incorporate science in the way that we think about the world, that science would be an essential resource to think and give meaning to the social reality of the subjects. And uh, I can mention some elements we consider, we could consider essential for the scientific culture uh, or, or cultures in contemporary societies. Uh, I would say in the first place, the integration of multiple frames of knowledge from natural sciences, from humanities, from social sciences and from other ways of knowing. Uh, we should be able to think from within an interdisciplinary approach or better yet, from a transdisciplinary approach. And uh, we always mention critical thinking. Yes, but I, I, I say not just that. In the contemporary world for thinking about big global problems like climate change or the pandemic, or regional problems like immigration, water pollution, or public health, uh, we need to have thinking resources, cognitive resources, and the skills to understand and make sense of contemporary social problems within the framework of complexity and to approach them from that perspective. Uh, the COVID pandemic has shown those the difficulty that many people have to think from complexity 
to, to look for simple cause-effect relationships. Uh, and uh, that's why we also need abilities to address and deal with uncertainty. Yeah. And it's important also to develop a way of thinking that encourages and promotes participation and agency. That's a very important part of what we think that uh, scientific culture should include. And finally, it's important and desirable to incorporate science in the cognitive resources and the ways to make sense of the world to guide decision-making and citizen participation. What I mean is that scientific culture should mobilize for action. And that's what I can say, Brian, from this perspective. <laughs> Okay, well, that's a, a very, very large agenda there. Um, uh, very many different terms and, and uh, dimensions to it. Uh, Leah, can I come back to you uh, with your ethnographer's hat on? Uh, if, when you consider what Susanna was saying about signification and the public imaginary uh, or public imagination, uh, when you consider what um, Aksu was saying about uh, public impressions and so on. Uh, how would you approach, and, and, and also Haksu was commenting on our fixation with researching attitudes uh, in a certain way. Um, how would you, if you were advising on approaching cultures of science and society from an ethnographic perspective, how would you go about that? And do you think that would be helpful to try and un unravel some of the big problems we're, we're, we're talking about here? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. And I also want to, um, to thank Masiamo for kind of wide widening the perception of the concept, because I think that the more we widen the concept, it also very easily translates to the research tools that we put forward when we're trying to understand scientific culture and whichever understanding or culture in society, culture, anyway, whichever way we wanna think about it, it's really um, important. And putting an ethnographer's hat on, I wanna say maybe something a little bit personal about how I came to understand that I need to understand science culture in my own work. And maybe through that, we can understand why attitudes in my perspective are, are really important, but maybe not the only way that we can go forward. Um, I think that one of the basic ideas in anthropology is that people um, are not always um, what they say. So if you ask people what they think about X, Y, Z, they'll say that they do ABC and they might believe that they do ABC, but it doesn't mean that's what they actually do. So ethnographers have always put together um, interviews as only one mode of data collection. There's also field work. And the fieldwork allows us to see behaviors in action and not just what people would tell us that they do, which is super important, but it only tells us what they think about or what they acknowledge that they do. So if you would ask me, Brian, to um, expand it a little bit, and not that everybody needs to um, be an ethnographer, but when we look at the way people behave, at the decisions that they make in action, in real life, sometimes those things can tell us really deep ideas about the way science is perceived in a particular setting. Um, and um, I guess the personal aspect here is that I started out on this journey studying contraception, studying reproductive decision-making among a particular um, Haredi ultra-Orthodox group in Israel. And everybody um, that I spoke to laughed at me because they said, well, it says that they're supposed to have lots of kids and you know, you're going to write the shortest PhD ever because they just do what their rabbis say. But when I started speaking to people about what they actually do, I understood that there was this whole umbrella about science and technology that was part of their decision making that people weren't really thinking about it because they were looking at them only through a religious lens of what the canon says. Um, and then I realized that they were they were making decisions and they had a lot of assumptions about science and technology and that we just weren't asking the right questions to hear about it. Um, so what I'm saying here is that, you know, it's obvious that scientists are people to speak about, about science, 
But thinking about the people that I study, as I started off by saying they're bad people to speak to, is because they don't really speak about science. They only maybe, if you would ask them, they would say that they're interested in the technologies, but the ideas about science are very um, not of interest to them, but they still have an ideology and a culture of science that they may not be able to articulate if you ask them what their ideas are, but if you can look at their everyday scenarios, then they do have, um, Susanna, what you were saying, they have social ideas about these things, even though they don't articulate them. And if they, and I'm not sure if you would give them a survey about attitudes that it would be able to fully um, uh, conceptualize what it is that they're saying. So I'm sorry for going on there, but I hope that that's helpful. I think it is. And I think we probably don't talk enough to people with the kind of background that you have in the field of science communication. I think it's very helpful. Uh, were you, I mean, excuse me for the kind of nerdy question, but I mean, were you using in-depth interviews? What were focus groups? What, what techniques were you using to try and get at what people were thinking? So the, the study that I was referring to, the first one, uh, was an ethnography that took about five years and it included interviews it included um, field work and lectures, classes about contraception, about the Jewish family and about science and technology. And the third thing is that I also um, collected um, different books, pamphlets about technology. So it's basically three methods. One is to ask the people what they actually do. And the second thing is to go, I always find that lectures are a really interesting space because then you have a negotiation of knowledge in that setting, you have the person who's teaching and then the questions. So when you can have both of what the teacher is saying and what the people are asking, that negotiation is a very helpful way, um, I find. And then the third thing, uh, which I um, have also found helpful, but it's not, I think that different people would have to find a, something that's worked their, con their context. But in the Jewish context, there's a lot of guidance books. So there's a lot of written materials written by rabbis, written by um, doctors who are trying to offer um, different guidelines and then you can um, code the data and the way that they talk about science in their guidebooks. Um, so I think that different people have to be flexible uh, to try to gather that data at different levels. Thanks Leah. Um, I wonder if I could shift uh, slightly to a question that is very uh, actual, and that is the question of trust in science. Um, Massimiano, do you, do you see there's a kind of relationship between this discussion about cultures of science in society and, and the question of trust or distrust in science? I think that if we take, if we take a broad notion of uh, culture, culture of science, um, Definitely, we know that in many societies today, um, trust in science and trust in scientists, it is part of the general culture uh, because levels, uh, um, as, as we know from, from many studies, international, national studies of public perception of science, uh, trust in science is not just high, but it has become increasingly higher. Uh, also during the, the recent pandemic. So I think a certain, uh, a certain vision, for example, of science as a resource for political decision is not something taken for granted or is not something that was always there. It's a cultural invention that uh, in, the way, in the form as we know it, uh, basically goes back to the, to the second half of the 20th century. From, for, for example, uh, to Vannevar Bush, famous uh, theorization 1945 of science as a goose laying golden eggs. So science is a political resource, is a resource for society. And, and, and for me, that is, that is definitely part of culture in, in many countries. And of, then, of course, there can be frictions and there can be political uses of scientific expertise that we may consider uh, less effective or uh, less appropriate. Uh, but uh, it, it would be very hard today to, to find uh, someone in a, in a society who claims that science is completely useless. What we see, take for example, uh, 
people who are skeptical about vaccines, what they what is their typical argument is not we should we don't need science. Their argument is to find counter uh, counter science, other expertise to counteract the 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 arguments, the arguments, for example, the policy for the, the policymakers' actions. So um, definitely, I mean, my answer my answer would be would be yes, and I think um, trust in science. Um, perception of the role of scientists in its, uh, uh, of course, which is, which is changing historically, is definitely part of, uh, of science and culture. Uh, I, there are some other questions I want to come back to with the panel, but I wonder, uh, Anna, Claudia, have you been keeping an eye on questions coming in from the attenders? Yes, Brian. Uh, the, do we infer that the scientific method is the core of science culture? It's an, a question. Um, also, okay. uh, yeah, uh, we'll just, just, we'll just stop on that one. So the question from AP Jayaraman is, do we infer that the scientific method is the core of science culture? So this is presumably thinking of science culture as the culture of scientists. Uh, or is it? Um, anybody want to comment on that or respond to that? Yeah, Haksu, yeah. Go on. When we talk about scientific culture, we, are, we should uh, separate uh, scientific culture in terms of the scientist perspective and scientific culture in the general public's perspective. But when we talk about scientific method, usually it seems it could imply the scientific scientist perspective, you know, in scientific culture. And so if we separate those two, uh, we may think about what is really important to the public perspective rather than scientist perspective. So we are confused between them. And then we are likely to impose scientist perspective about scientific culture to the general public, mm. you see? And then we are just totally confounded and confused. That is a big problem to us, I think. Yeah, and I think it is a, a lively question as to whether there is such a thing as the scientific method, the one and only scientific method. Uh, there may indeed be many different methods, but uh, okay. Uh, there's a question here from uh, Alex Perry, have studies been done asking scientists what they think scientific culture is and from where and how they obtain this understanding? Uh, we, 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 we ask uh, in surveys scientists all sorts of questions. I'm not sure if we've asked them those sorts of questions. Ask me, Anna, do, you, do you know? I know studies about I know studies about scientists' perception of communication and the general yeah. public, and I've been involved myself in some of these studies. I'm not aware specifically of uh, this this type of question, which wouldn't be easy to articulate. And, and yeah. also, yeah. <laughs> there is actually an, an additional meaning of scientific culture, which is the subculture of different scientific fields, which used to be very important historically. Uh, for example, the way you actually craft experiments, uh, manual culture, uh, how you, you make things and you do things. And this, of course, was, was more, much more identifiable and clear when, when science was, uh, so to say, a, a, a smaller thing. Uh, much more of a community or set of communities. We should never forget that we are talking today when we talk about the scientific uh, activity, we're talking about a global enterprise of involving between five and six million researchers worldwide uh, with a huge varieties, not just among different fields, but within fields. Um, you remember the you may remember the famous picture of Solvay conference 1927 where you could fit 
in a single picture uh, all the, the, the theoretical physicists that matter on the Earth. Uh, now, as I, as I understand, there are only in the United States 200,000 theoretical physicists. So, I mean, the notion of culture inevitably is much more complex and fragmented even within a scientific field. This is, might be one of the reasons why we have so much trouble nailing down the notion, or, or, or we just shouldn't nail down science culture to a single meaning. <laughs> yeah. I was in the hotel in, in Brussels, uh, I think it's called the Metropole, where parts of that meeting took place. And the picture is there in the foyer. As you say, they're all there, Einstein and Planck and so on, they're all there. Um, yeah, uh, anonymous attendee, uh, there's always one of them. There's an international element to scientific culture. Science is generic, but it's perceived differently in different cultures, depending on the prism it's seen through. Now, we've touched on this, uh, but uh, I wonder if we're approaching a, bit, a more refined understanding of it. You know, that even that there are things you can do in English, like make a distinction between scientific culture and science culture, that you can't do in Spanish, for example, because it's cultura científica, uh, which uh, la, 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 very difficult to make that distinction between scientific culture and science culture, and equally scientific communication and science communication, because again, it's comunicación científica, whereas in, in English, which is a, in this instance, a bit more flexible, uh, and often is more flexible to the point that it actually becomes ambiguous. Uh, but I just, just today, because it occurred to me, I'd never heard the phrase used in German, which is famously very adept at putting things together. So in German, science communication is Wissenschaftskommunikation. Uh, so you should equally be able to say that scientific culture is Wissenschaftskultur. And the phrase hardly occurs. It's it doesn't it, it is even though as I say it's very easy to put things together in in German. It's just not a phrase that's used, or or, or if it is used, it's used in a very narrow sense to describe the culture, the environment within which science happens. Uh, so quite different from Latin languages. And Massimiliano, you must be very aware of this, being a native speaker of a Latin language but also working through English and familiar with German and so on. Uh, so, in, as I said earlier at the very beginning, in an international context, we need to be aware of these nuances, don't we? Uh, and, and maybe your last point, Massimiliano, is the one that we need to hang on to. Was we should maybe resist trying to define scientific culture as a single unambiguous thing, because we won't succeed, or, or we'll only succeed by by coercion, by brutality, uh, and we don't want to do that. Can I move on just as, as one uh, towards the latter part of this uh, session to the relationship between scientific culture and science communication? Um, and Haksu touched on it very early on. Uh, Susanna, uh, would you like to address that question? Yes, thank you. Uh, I will talk from my experience and from this uh, sociocultural perspective of science communication. Um, but uh, from my experience, both in practice and research, I work and I have proposed uh, what I call a radical term for, for science communication. Uh, I mean the transition from communicating scientific knowledge in itself to place the social problems at the center, integrating scientific knowledge from multiple disciplines for the intellection and explanation of the complex social problems in which subjects are immersed in several scales. So I propose to start from the subjects life worlds uh, and their systems of and frameworks of significations in order to establish dialogue and discussion uh, to assume the role of the communicator as a cultural mediator, encouraging productive communication practices 
within the groups and facilitating the harmonization of the different frameworks of understandings, the concepts, visions, and needs. Uh, I have experienced some projects with uh, vulnerable actors and a way of working that has resulted effective and productive, not only to engage people with science, but to engage scientists with social problems is the joint construction of the problem and knowledge with the close work and direct dialogue with social actors. In this model, communicators participate actively in the process of the research, not only at the final stage with its results. So we are building or trying to build a kind of common scientific culture as a result of collaborative work. And here's what I can find the relationship between uh, sci um, scientific culture and science communication. Uh, communication in this way is more effective at, as it takes place during and after the process of research. Uh, this current of communication of science uh, shifts its interest from encouraging involvement with scientific knowledge for its own sake, to untangling, understanding, and communicating social problems for the explicit purpose of contributing with social transformation. So uh, that's the way that uh, I can uh, uh, relate the, the importance, the relevance of scientific culture with the way that we are uh, working uh, in science communication in this uh, trend or current of science communication. Okay, thanks. Uh, actually, I think that you had made the connection between science communication and scientific culture er early on. Uh, as I understood it, your ambition with the Academy of Scientific Culture was to improve science communication, uh, both by scientists and by others. Um, if you were doing the same job now today that you were addressing 25 years ago, would you would you use different terminology or how would you approach that? Um, yes, the, uh, basically, as I mentioned, the Academy for Scientific Culture in Korea was aimed to promote science is the province of the capability yeah, to the scientists as well as to the public. And so in that sense, uh, science communication was also functionally defined to communicate science to solve the problems rather than to communicate the scientific uh, knowledge to the general public. You see? Because the people are the most interested in problem first, and then problem involves engagement okay. and then to solve that problem with engagement people need the scientific knowledge in the second place you see not first place that's why we need a two-step of science communication i propose that i argued for that so in that academy always i tried to explain that that kind of two steps rather than disseminate scientific uh, knowledge in the first place to the general public, you see? And so if I do, right now, same thing will happen. I will pursue same kind of uh, the approach. And also, I'd like to comment on another one about trust in science. You see, that trust in science uh, is also, don't you think that it is, Scientist perspective. Don't you think uh, such trust in science is uh, demanded by the scientist? Yeah. But actually, to the general public, public people are interested in uh, trust in science's problem solving capability. See, general public could uh, observe or could check their own trust in science is a problem solving capability rather than trust in science in general, which is a sort of thing for general public to, you know, 
to pursue them. And so what I am saying is that trust in science, and fact that their science indicates the scientific facts or knowledge or whatever, we need to uh, we need to be more specific about trust in science. What? Otherwise, such term is easy, sounds easy, but so difficult to be explicated. Okay? And then we use we usually measure with just a summary value like the attitude of our opinion or whatever. Uh, some attribute. So, so I'd like to uh, comment about the trust in. in, in. Okay. Thanks, Aksu. Uh, we have just three minutes uh, left. Uh, there was a question from Siddharth Kankaria, uh, uh, which came in earlier about the difficulty of defining scientific culture, and he asked the panelists to comment on the difficulty of dealing with this dynamic nature of pinpointing what constitutes scientific culture. I hope that in the discussion since he asked the question, we have actually been doing that uh, reasonably well. I haven't been following what's going on in chat, and I don't know, Anna Claudia, do you, is there anything in chat that's a question that really should be addressed in the last two minutes? No, not in the chat, but I think it just uh, okay. the question okay. you read. Yeah. Okay, we've been keeping an eye on Q and A. Um, well, how do we possibly conclude uh, from all of this? <laughs> Can we conclude from all of this? I guess I guess one conclusion, it's not an easy conclusion, uh, but it is uh, obvious culture is a difficult term to use and combining it with science as scientific culture or the culture of science or science culture or, or even cultures of science. And I should say, Anne Dijkstra has drawn, my, drawn our attention to the use of the German phrase Wissenschaft Kulturen, so the cultures of science, which is different again. Um, uh, but uh, I guess these are but two difficult terms to use and certainly difficult to use when they're conjoined with each other. And we need to be very careful uh, about how we do it. And maybe that's the message for the International Day. <laughs> and that is uh, you know, be careful out there in how you present this, because it may appear, I think, and Aksu, I think, has been stressing this point, and Massimiano and Dia in different ways, stressing this point, it may appear that this is a, an exercise purely in promoting scientists' understanding of their own position in the world, uh, as distinct from, you know, relating to public's own imagination, concerns, ideas, impressions, and so on. Uh, and, and working from there. But anyway, I'm not going to start the conversation again, but thank you uh, to the panelists for taking part. Thank you for, to the 70 plus participants for being here. Thank you for your uh, comments coming in uh, of thanks and uh, congratulations to the panel. Uh, and we'll end it there and wish everybody a happy International Day of Scientific Culture tomorrow. Uh, and more meetings of this kind uh, to uh, struggle to understand better what we mean with the terms that we use in day-to-day -day, uh, contexts. Thank you very much, uh, and goodbye to you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Brian. Bye-bye.